First up, we have Andrew McCall, who is a political scientist at the University of Chicago, and he's going to tell us about police expertise, political control, and racial bias in discretionary arrests. Um, so same format as yesterday, Andrew, feel free to leave time for a discussion at the end. Uh, the next talk is in an hour. Please, everyone, uh, feel free to jump in with questions. I uh, maybe as a, I guess, as part of an introduction to this project, I'm working on a book about uh, police reform in the era immediately preceding and covering the civil rights movement, because you've got a lot of the structures which currently govern how policing is supposed to work, um, sort of put into place at this point. And there was a lot of, um, you know, this is the last time we saw a lot of movement on how police department works, departments worked and how police officers were trained. Um, and so there's the, this project, this individual paper comes out of reading a ton of archival documents and old stuff written by police chiefs about how policing should work. So um, yeah, if you have any questions, please jump in because uh, I, I recognize it's still difficult for me to see what is common knowledge and what is not. So, um, uh, so the question motivating the model in this paper, um, and so the paper is simply, are police departments designed such that officers will in general have accurate beliefs about the most effective relationship between race and the probability of discretionary arrests? So, you know, this, you, for those um, trained in economics here, obviously you'll see this, this comes directly out of, you know, can officers efficiently use statistical discrimination? Um, oftentimes in studies of statistical discrimination, we sort of assume that um, inefficient beliefs will be corrected uh, through some process, but in policing, um, my argument here is that, is that that's not necessarily true. Um, so the intellectual foundations of this particular project are uh, first uh, racial formation theory. Uh, for those of you who are less familiar with this, this comes out of ethnic studies and sociology. It's, um, but sort of the essential tenet of this that I'm using is that it treats race as a system of social meanings, the content of which is constantly changing and the site of conflict. So you get you know, debates about what blackness means. You get, um, you know, uh, Khalil Muhammad has this fantastic book about intellectual arguments about the, the connection between race and criminality in, in uh, early 20th century. So like, you know, um, but sort of the, the first tenet then is to think of race and racial meanings not as fixed, but as things that people are learning um, and that, that are uh, um, features of political competition. Um, what, what about what about uh, categorization itself? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, the existence of categorization. Yes, absolutely. Um, so um, so yeah. who's in what, who, who's called black and white is also evolving over time. Definitely, um, and and that's an interesting. That's an area of uh, of active study um, by racial formation scholars. What the racial categories are, who belongs to them, what the meanings of these categories are, um, both in terms of everyday practice, but then also how those categories correlate with both power in society and sort of the, the you know the distribution of resources within society. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a really cool area of research. Um, uh, so the second intellectual foundation for this project in this is theory of statistical discrimination, as it, particularly within policing. Obviously, this is due to uh, Phelps' arrow, and then, as far as I know, Knowles, Persico, and Todd were the first to apply it within within the policing context. Um, and so, the, like from there, the main point that I'm pulling is that discrimination can be driven by beliefs. You know, the rational use of information can can lead to discrimination. Um, uh, the third leg of this of this project is uh, research on strategic communication and information use, especially within bureaucracies. So you know, cheap talk models, obviously, are the, the foundation of, of a lot of this research. Um, and then, um, you know, sort of different people have applied it within bureaucracies in particular. And uh, Gail Martin Patty's work is, uh, is the one that I rely on most, uh, mostly. And so then, you know, what we see from this literature, um, a, a now well-established fact is that policy disagreement can limit information transmission. Um, you know, you're not going to necessarily believe uh, cheap talk advice from someone who wants something that you don't want to happen. Um, and finally, the sort of the other literature with which I'm engaging is this uh, work on the post-World War II development and construction of the U.S. carceral state. 
Um, and so these are scholars who are interested in explaining, you know, why did we see mass incarceration emerge and why does it have the racial characteristics that it does in the United States? Um, and so then sort of the crucial pieces out of this literature that I'm pulling on are that the racial consequences of criminal justice policies was a point of political strategy and contention. Um, and the coalitions that emerged to support different kinds of policy changes were messy. Um, so the sort of the, the two, maybe the headline points out of this are Veshla Weaver's argument um, that rather sort of rather than a backlash to the civil rights movement, we can understand the growth of racialized mass incarceration in the United States as a, as a result of strategy by racial conservatives to, you know, they lost on civil rights. So they decided to use a different policy area, criminal justice, to replicate the same kinds of policy outcomes that they wanted. So, you know, there, there was active fighting over this. Um, and in terms of the messy coalitions, uh, uh, Two fantastic works in this area are Nim Murakawa's uh, the, uh, the First Civil Right, where she talks about how racial liberals in the 50s and 60s, and especially supported police reforms, police professionalization that pumped lots of money into these departments, um, which was also what racial conservatives wanted at that point. And so they're supporting it from different sides for different reasons, um, but they both end up coming down on the side of let's strengthen the carceral state. Um, Obviously, racial, racial liberals had this objective of strengthening it such that it would reduce discrimination, um, where racial conservatives had this objective of simply strengthening it and ideally preserving its, its prior uh, racial inequality. Um, so that um, for the purpose of this paper, um, what I'm thinking about is bureaucrat, you know, in general, bureaucratic information used for racial equality. So it requires an organization to do two things. One, it has to detect racial bias in officer decisions. And two, and this is the hard part, induce officers to change behavior when that bias is detected. And so, um, you know, this is why police reformers today and in the past have talked about things like civilian review boards or um, uh, an end to qualified immunity for police officers or public access to complaint records, the idea that it would that they could subsidize police department efforts at detecting racial bias, but also change the balance of, of incentives for police officers, you know, make, make the threat of punishment when racial bias is detected uh, stronger. And so like, you know, this is, uh, this is not a, this is not a new idea. Um, and so, but this, this idea of sort of what correcting officers' beliefs is, is absent from most work in statistical discrimination because as a feature of perfect Bayesian equilibria, you know, uh, this, this, is, is gonna, this is assuming that officers have correct beliefs about the usefulness of race. And so then um, what I'm doing here is endogenizing that question, you know, what, um, thinking about a particular learning source and whether they can extract um, accurate information from it. Um, and so I guess the, the overarching point of this paper that I, I would really like to make to particularly people at this, this, this conference is that when we're thinking about um, when we're thinking about mechanisms to change discriminatory behavior within an institution, you know, we have to think about it on these two levels. One, we have to think about what are the drivers of it within that institution, possibly be beliefs or other kinds of cognitive processes. But the second is to think about the like how that set of practices of that set of um, drivers is embedded within a political context and how that political context is going to influence interventions um, or, um, or this continuing uh, operation of that system. And that's what I'm doing with this paper. Uh, we need to think not only about internal bureaucratic features or internal you know, features of, political, uh, of police officers' minds, but also about the political context. So the summary of my argument is simply that um, with the current police department information structure that was achieved in mid 20th century police reforms, the public pressure campaigns interfere with the chief's ability to communicate what the most effective arrest practices are going to be. Um, and so when pressure is asymmetric, that is to say when, you know, when, for example, that you police are under heavy pressure to reduce arrests in low income or minority communities, that then officer learning is going to be constrained asymmetrically. Specifically, the officers are going to learn less or not be able to learn that that's the most effective arrest practice. So you get this, um, uh, what I call constrained learning. And it matters because before this professionalization move, the status quo was extreme overpunishment of black people uh, by the by police, police departments. Um, and 
Then when we move into this post-civil rights era, professionalizing reforms made it harder for patrol officers to learn that reducing punishment for black residents was most effective. Because that's, um, if you sort of think about that asymmetry, those who want high arrest rates for black people didn't have to pressure the police at all because that's what they were already doing. And so the reform movements were by and large attempting to reduce this disparity. Um, and so you, this is where this asymmetry emerges. Um, so the crucial information features of a professionalized police department uh, that, I'm, that I'm relying on here are one, that you get this regular pressure on police chiefs to change policy. And sort of part of that then is that the position of a police chief in an American city is not secure. Um, civil service reforms during the progressive era and I mean, some of them much later, or rather the introduction of civil service systems, protected police officers at the, at the rank and file level from political retribution, but then also, you know, uh, in some places also uh, uh, from accountability for their behaviors. Um, but police chiefs never got that kind of, uh, that kind of protection. And uh, so police reformers, police in particular police chiefs who were advocating reform in this period, one of their goals was to get job protection for police chiefs as well, but this was one of the features of their reform platform that they never achieved. Their argument was, you know, if we're the experts, we should be independent. And so, you know, you should give us job tenure for, you know, for life or for, you know, as long as good behavior persists. And then that will free us from political constraints. And we will no longer be uh, susceptible to, uh, to this outside influence. That did not happen in any American city that I'm aware of. Um, so the second feature of, of this inf information environment is that expertise is concentrated at the top of the organization. Um, and they're, they're trying to increasingly centralize decisions, uh, especially during this period, but, but still today. Um, and so by that, what I'm, what I'm referring to is that the, sort of the model of professionalization they were pursuing is that they have a command, uh, a command structure at the top that will study crime that will study sort of the effects of different interventions and they will arrive at through in, including quantitative studies uh, ideas about what the most effective practices are going to be and that that's going to be the driver of the, uh, the development of policing here. Um, and so I think I should note this is a flipping of the conventional um, information asymmetry in most uh, delegation models where we usually we think about or uh, you know, we're used to thinking about the agents as having more information about the decision. But in policing, this is an area where there's good reason to believe that that's not true um, because what police officers observe you know, on the street level is only you know, the outcomes that they, the, the people that they arrest. Um, and, so, and so this problem of not observing the, the people they never arrest is, is particularly strong at the officer level. And when you move up the chain, uh, chiefs who are analyzing data from an entire department, they have at least some mechanisms to, to, to try and mitigate that. Um, uh, yeah, and, yeah, and additional tools uh, at their disposal. And finally, uh, the last feature is simply uncertainty about the optimal use of arrests. This is a thing that, you know, under different circumstances, uh, the, the best, you know, uh, whether you know, more or fewer arrests would be the most effective way of controlling crime is going to change. Um, um, and so this uh, this quote comes out of uh, O.W. Sorry, Wilson. Sorry, could, could you elaborate the uncertainty? I'm sorry. Uh, in the sense, is there uncertainty over preferences? In other words, I should wait, uh, uh, you know, fairness considerations against deterrence, or is there uncertainty about the uh, the, the elasticities of, uh, of criminality uh, in different categories of people with respect to stop rates? The second one. Thank you. Okay. Yes, All the right. second one. Um, yeah, and that's that's a feat. Sort of the idea is that that's a feature of the world that changes over time and is um, and across populations. And, yeah. um, okay, so uh, just to sort of to to bring you back into some of these sources that I've read, O. W. Wilson was the chief of police in Chicago from 1960 to I believe 66. Uh, before that, he was the dean of the criminology school at UC Berkeley, and he'd been he was. Um, 
he was one of the pillars of the police reform movement in this period. Um, and his, his book uh, police, on police administration, uh, which this quote is taken from, was called The Bible of Police Professionalism uh, by historians writing about the period. And he writes that the police are subjected to influences from a wide variety of sources, both the good and the bad politician, the influential businessman, the civic leader, and the newspapermen all have access to grind at some point or other. Even the average citizen is not above reminding the police that he is a taxpayer. If the police are allowed to are to follow an intelligently planned program, they must resist the, the many influences that tend to divert them from their course. Um, and so, you know, this is expressing exactly this, this concern that police in this period had. Of how do they establish independence from these political pressures um, and the, the necessity to do so to affect, uh, you know, to create the most effective crime control institutions that they could, uh, which was very much their goals, uh, or at least the goals of these reformers. Um, and a second quote uh, from the same work, uh, principles and objectives must be weighted on the scale of expediency within the framework of no compromise with crime or corruption. The police chief must keep his main objective in view and yield a secondary objective when to remain obdurate threatens the success of his program. When insistence against powerful influences jeopardizes what has already been accomplished, it is folly not to yield, especially when the point at issue is relatively unimportant. And so this, this sort of expresses the, the recognition of the political reality that they, they faced in this period. You know, these police chiefs, even where they were, you know, experts with all of the, the best information about how to, to, um, to, to direct their departments, people want things and powerful people want things. And when a powerful enough group wants something, um, you know, you, you have to go along with it if you want to keep your job. Um, and so then, I sort of build these features into the model and ask what happens to officer beliefs when you have expertise concentrated at the top of the bureaucracy, second, a possibly successful pressure campaign to change police practices, and third, officers that may just follow orders. And the conclusion is constrained learning. That is to say that there are certain, you know, depending on the parameter spaces, there are some things that police officers may not be able to learn from their police chief. Um, and the intuition is simply that when a chief assigns a change that an influential pressure group wants, they can't tell why that, that assignment was given. The chief's choice might reflect their expertise about what would best control crime, or it could uh, reflect their desire to satisfy the pressure group. And so in the presence of public pressure campaigns, officer learning from assignments is, is going to be asymmetric. If, that, if those, um, specifically, it's going to be less in the direction of stronger pressure. So. Um, so I model this as a N plus one game, player game of in, uh, imperfect information. So I've got a chief and N patrol officers. The chief is gonna give an assignment. The patrol officer is gonna make arrest choices after you know, observing that assignment. And so the complications of the model are, all are built into the chief that they uh, have private information about whether their own preferences. So that either they're gonna be a type that cares about uh, implementing the most effective policy, or they're gonna be a type that wants to satisfy a political pressure group. And also, um, they are the ones who know what the most effective arrest intensity is. And then they are the, they are the ones who know that the direction of the strongest pressure. So uh, the way that I model it is that the, the, um, they're, either press, they're pressured either to raise or reduce arrest intensity. And which direction they're being pressured in is not something that the officers directly observe. So it, it could be going either direction, but the officers are going to have a prior beliefs about you know, which side is stronger and therefore which side the chief is most likely to be influenced by. And so then I have a fixed proportion of officers who are crime motivated and the rest are, are conflict diverse. And, and so this is a way of building in that some oversight is possible within the police organization. So some officers can be induced to just follow orders and some officers might just follow orders because that's the cognitively easiest thing to do, uh, but, but others aren't necessarily going to. Others are um, going to- Andrew, just to ask a little bit more about that. So yeah. what, um, what is exactly what preferences a crime motivated officer have versus the conflict of ones? That's right here. Oh, that's right, okay, perfect. Um, so I represent the department objectives simply, uh, you know, negative quadratic. Uh, so this is their effect on crime. Um, and so the XIs are the, the arrest choices of the officer, each officer I, and then omega is which arrest intensity would be most effective. And so they're trying to match the state. Um, so the patrol officers either care about their individual effect on crime, doing the right thing, um, from a perspective of the department performance, or they care about 
matching their assignment. And so the A here is gonna be the, the police chief's assignment. Um, and then the police chief is either gonna care about department performance or they care about matching this other variable gamma, which represents the, the pressure group's goal. And so I limit the state space here. There's, as I said, there's um, this maintain, re reduce, or uh, maintain, lower, or raise. Shouldn't use the R twice. Are the two possible um, optimal arrest intensities? And the pressure group is going to either be pressuring for an increase or a reduction in uh, in arrests. And so the game sequence. Uh, Nature of random chance is going to determine whether the chief is independent, whether the arrest should go up, down, or remain the same, and then which pressure group is most influential. And then the chief is going to observe all that information, um, and, and then they're going to give an assignment. And then the patrol officers are going to observe their own type and the assignment, and then choose an arrest intensity to implement it. Um, so um, in analyzing this game, I'm going to lay out what I, um, I'm only going to look at uh, pure strategy, perfect Bayesian equilibria, and I'm going to lay out what um, what I call a semi-truthful equilibrium. And so this is an equilibrium where the the independent chief always chooses the most effective uh, arrest intensity. Um, and then I'm going to focus on parameters where the P's have it, the uh, the patrol officers have at least moderate confidence in the status quo. And so I'm not looking at where they're basically you know extremes of the distribution where they're certain that they should change the policy. So, cause I'm, I'm interested in looking at the features of this, this environment when officers are fairly confident in what's going on, but then they need to be moved um, by a police chief. And so the structure of this semi-truthful equilibrium is that the response, the, so the independent chief is always gonna give the most effective assignment. The responsive chief is always gonna assign pressure group goals. And then the conflict diverse patrol officers are always gonna follow all assignments, but then the crime motivated patrol officers are gonna sometimes follow all assignments, but then sometimes they, they're gonna only follow some of them because, um, yeah, because the pressure group's intervention is going to reduce the credibility of certain assignments from the police chief. So the response of chief's decision simply falls out of, um, uh, if it's sequentially rational for the independent chief to choose any of the three assignments when it's correct, then it's also going to be sequentially rational for the uh, the, pre the responsive chief to do so. Um, and then the patrol officer strategy falls out of their utility function as well. You know, they move the, the the crime motivated patrol officers will only increase or decrease their arrest intensity if they are sufficiently convinced by their by the assignment that doing so will improve department performance because that's what they care about while the conflict of adverse officers are just going to follow their assignment um, so this is a very low supervision environment obviously that i've that i've represented um, and so then the crucial feature of this model uh thinking about this this is a as an exercise in racial construction is when or what patrol officers are going to learn. Um, and so the extent of the learning from their assignment is going to depend on pressure group influence and the chances that the chief is independent. Um, and so assignments to change arrest practices are going to be more convincing from a chief who is more likely to be independent because you know that's then you're more confident that that's the, you know, the right policy for sure. And then they're going to be more convincing when they run counter to what the most powerful pressure group wants. And so in an environment where you have basically symmetrical pressure groups, um, th this this doesn't show up, but then when more there's more pressure coming from one side, uh, that's where you're going to see um, you're going to see deformation in, in what the which direction that the officers can learn. Um, and so the the result that I'm about to show you a photo of or a picture of is that there's no perfect Bayesian equilibria exists where the crime motivated patrol officers will obey assignments to lower or raise arrest intensity if the chief is independent with probability less than a particular learning threshold. Um, and so this is, you know, you can think of this as sort of how strong the chief's position needs to be um, in order to, to get them to be able to enact a particular kind of policy change. And this learning threshold is gonna be lower for changes that the officers expect to work and higher in the direction that the chief is likely to be pressured in. Um, an illustration of that is right here. So. Uh, although 
y-axis of this figure is the probability that the chief is independent, and the x-axis is the probability that the responsive chief will assign to raise arrest intensity. So um, the middle of this graph in this area is where the, the, pressure, the, the pressure is equally likely to come from both sides. The left side is when the pressure is most likely to be in the direction of reducing arrest intensity. The right side is when the pressure is most likely to be in favor of arrest, uh, raising arrest intensity. And so what this, these parameters do is they divide the space into um, four regions. Beneath, beneath these, two, uh, these two solid lines represent the learning thresholds. When the probability of the chief is independent falls, falls below this line, they can no longer oops, they can no longer learn that lowering arrest intensity is the most effective policy. Um, when it falls below this line, they can no longer learn that raising arrest intensity is the most effective policy. Um, and so you'll notice on the left side here where the coalition in favor of lowering arrest intensity is the most likely to be affecting what the police chief is choosing. You get this big area where the officers can't learn that, that lowering arrest intensity is the most effective policy. Uh, and this is, this is where that, that asymmetry starts to bite and the, you get the same thing on the other side. Um, and so, uh, Andrew, a, so just to um, go back to that figure for a second. So when you say can learn LNR, do you mean that almost surely they learn the correct state or with positive probability they learn the correct state? I see. Uh, so like in that region, and, essentially, and also the same in the cannot learn L region, do they almost surely learn R or they do with positive probability? But So what this, well, sorry, uh, thank you for that question. Well, what I mean here is when they're assigned to lower or raise up here in this light gray area, they will follow that instruction. So they, they can learn either of those when they're, when they're told that that's the right thing. Um, on the, in the bottom here, they will learn neither of those. So they, uh, um, and then on the left, they will learn only, that they can learn that raising arrest intensity is the most effective policy, but they can't learn that lowering it is the most effective policy. Does that answer your question? And so that's, that's all conditional on being assigned it? Yes, yes, from okay. the assignment. This is, yes, all about what they will learn from the assignment. And then when L is the most effective policy, are they assigned it almost surely or with positive probability? Or like, I'm wondering what sort of what sort of statements you can make about what the likelihood of learning is. Yeah, so um, it's it's all wrapped up into um, into this variable here, which so this is all like them being good Bayesians. Um, they are going to be assigned if the chief is independent. They're going to be assigned the correct policy with certainty. Um, and then if the chief is responsive, they're gonna be assigned the correct policy um, with the likelihood that the, you get correspondence between the, what the pressure group wants and, and the correct policy. That is to say, yeah, so the- um, Okay, so conditional on the police chief being the independent type, they'll learn it almost surely in the region where they can learn both and then condition on the police chief being the um, other type, then they'll learn it essentially depending on the conditions of the pressure group. Yes, and so, yes, and, and I guess the, the one caveat I will note here is in that case, they might learn it and be wrong because they'll be told to say, say the pressure group ends up being uh, in favor of lowering arrest intensity, they can be told that, and over here, up here, they can they will believe that, but if they have a responsive chief, it might not actually be true. Okay, and then just to clarify, so by learn, you mean their beliefs converge to placing probability one on this lowering being the most effective policy? Um, no, so what I, the, what I mean is they their beliefs are in, that that's the correct policy are high enough that they're willing to do it. Okay, so it's an implication of actions, not belief about the underlying state. That's so uh, their their actions are going to depend upon their beliefs. So of course, yeah. Yes, but yeah. Yeah. So this might be, I guess this might just be a um, semantics difference between econ and political science. And that's why I'm asking for clarification. So you mean essentially they can have beliefs such that they will choose action L when told action L is what you mean by learn L? Yes. Okay. Yeah. As opposed to their belief converges to placing probability one on um, omega L. That's correct. Okay. Um, and almost no, they will only, their beliefs will only converge to place, pro, placing probability one on any of the um, 
any of the change assignments under sort of in the far corners of the parameter space when they're certain that they have a responsive, then they have a independent chief. Okay. Yeah. So I think one thing to highlight then is um, in a status setting like this, once they're choosing L, obviously they're choosing L, so sort of their beliefs don't particularly matter for the action here. But in a dynamic setting, so if there were, say, subsequent rounds of police chiefs and changes, if they converge to placing probability one on the wrong state, that would be a lot more problematic to get them to change again in the future than yeah. if they're choosing L, but their beliefs are interior, and so then they would still be sensitive to future information. Like if you started thinking yes. about dy the dynamic implications of something like this. Um, yes, that, thank you for that. Um, um, yes, and their beliefs do, are not gonna be converging in this, in this model. One, um, uh, okay, yes, yeah, so this second figure then, it plots the same quantities. So these are going to be, uh, these, um, these regions are where their beliefs are high enough or low enough such that they will change their behavior. Um, that, that's what I mean by cannot learn or can learn. Um, and so again, the y-axis is the probability the chief is independent, and then the x-axis is the probability that the responsive chief is going to assign rays. And so down here we have where, uh, where the most likely political interference in police department activity is going to be trying to reduce to lower arrest intensity. And up here, they're going to be trying to raise it. And, but what I've done here is that I've changed the underlying parameters of, about what the officers believe is most likely to be the most effective policy ex ante. And so this is a circumstance where they think that raising arrest intensity is most likely to be the most effective. And so the, the sim symmetry of the previous figure goes away. Um, where this region where they can't learn or they, where they will, no, will not be convinced that lowering arrest intensity is the most effective policy has gotten a lot bigger, obviously. Um, and so there's there are two crucial things that, that this shows. Um, one, so sort of like, he's thinking historically, um, the criminological consensus in the early 20th century was that black people were more prone to criminality for either social or biological reasons. Sort of the, the big innovation of the, of, the, of the mid sort of the liberal shift was that was a shift to explaining that uh, in terms of environmental factors rather than biological factors. Um, and uh, there, there's been great work written on how on how sort of that conclusion was, was sort of central to the construction of, of, um, of what's subsequent racial inequality and criminal justice. But the sort of the main point is that throughout the period that I'm considering and arguably still today, police officers are gonna be in, not gonna be in this world where they have basically equal beliefs about whether lowering or raising arrest intensities are, are the most effective. They're gonna be in this world. And so the, um, the amount of influence that a pressure group can have before they start constraining the learning of police officers is in part dependent upon those officers' prior beliefs about what's likely to be the most effective policy. And so then um, a, when the, you know, a, a in this environment where officers have low ex anti expectations that reducing arrests will be most effective. A group that wants to raise arrests can have a lot more influence in the form of reducing you know, uh, the probability the chief is independent before they constrain the learning of officers in the direction that they want to move it. Over here, however, a group has, uh, a group's influence is going to start constraining officer learning much sooner. You can sooner, and you can see by the, the uh, it's a much higher threshold of chief's probable independence where they are still able to, uh, to believe that chief. The way that I worked this first model assumed that there was a single definition of what crime control meant, um, what effective policing was. And uh, one observation that falls immediately out of historical work in policing is that some groups have different goals for what the police should do. Um, this is arguably still true. Um, and so one great example from Chicago is the Chicago Crime Commission um, versus black clergy. So in the 19, well, Chicago Crime Commission started in the, in the teens, but they had this 
basically this idea of they wanted the police to most arrest as many people who they found violating certain sets of laws as possible. And so the, where they came into conflict in the 1940s, black clergy started appealing to the, the Chicago Police Department to stop arresting so many black people for violating gambling laws with the idea that this was not a thing that was doing tremendous damage to the community in which these people lived, but the arrests were doing more damage. Um, the Crime Commission's position on the other hand was it's against the law, it should be stopped. Um, and so, you know, you have these two different ideas about what kinds of crimes police officers should be focusing on when they're making arrests. Um, and so uh, to, to represent this, I, I, which I don't have mounted here on slides, um, uh, I solve an extension to this where there are two possible objectives to show that disagreement over police goals can generate the same kind of information transmission inefficiency. Um, if those in, in sort of what well, the crucial point is how similar or different those those two objectives are. And so when you have very just simply two different goals for what police should be doing, you're going to you're going to generate the same kind of an effect. And so the implication from that is simply that political disagreement about what police should be trying to achieve can selectively reduce information transmission, uh, producing rational and inefficient discrimination in this in this case. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay. I'm gonna, yeah, so, um, you know, the, the conclusion of this model is that this practice of trying to pressure police to change their behavior um, is going to produce this, this potential back, you know, not backlash, but resistance to change in the direction that you want. And so one could ask, why would a political organization or you know, why would people try to do this if it's gonna have this effect? Um, and I, that's a much broader set of questions that I'm, I'm not going to be able to answer right here, but I do just want to offer two thoughts. The first is that successful pressure will change the behavior of obedient officers. Um, and so there's going to be a benefit in, in terms of harm reduction. And it might be that that harm reduction uh, outweighs the, the, the harm of belief deter deformation or deterioration, which is going to then have, you know, it's, a, it's you know, depending on how many officers are thinking hard about what the most effective arrest intensity is. You know, this is, this is gonna be a, a, a greater or lesser harm. And the second point is that groups with, who, with goals that are less likely to be arrived at without their intervention, um, they lose less from reducing the chief's independence. That is to say the cost of, of crossing that threshold where the crime motivated officers will no longer learn in the direction that they want, um, that, that it goes down as their preferred policy becomes less likely. Um, and to, I won't give that, but to sort of, to represent this, I graphed what, you know, uh, this is not a strategic actor in the model, but the, the outcome, the, sorry, the utility of a pressure group that they would receive if they have the same goals as the, the responsive police chief. Um, and so the y-axis is simply the expected utility from a, a semi- truthful equilibrium this, this that I've been studying. And then the x-axis here is the probability that the chief is independent. And so you can think about moving down the x-axis as increasing the pressure group's influence over the police department. Um, and so you'll see that when, uh, so the, the different lines here represent uh, pressure group utility with different probability that their preferred policy will occur. And so, the top one is when their preferred policy is likely to occur, and the bottom one is when it's very unlikely to be the correct policy, and then the middle one is, is in between. And you'll notice that the gap here, but this gap is where learning is constrained. And so this is the loss from crossing that threshold into no longer being able, uh, being able to convince officers that, that your preferred policy is, is the best one. And so that, that gap is bigger if your preferred policy is more likely to occur than down here, when it's very unlikely to occur. And so what I'm pulling out of this is simply that groups who are advocating for something that flies in the face of the criminological consensus are actually like, they have less to lose by pursuing this kind of outside strategy. And that might help us explain why you see mass protests against racial inequality in policing, advocating for a reduction in harm in particularly black and Latinx communities um, and so zooming out finally, uh, the implications of this are simply that, you know, under a Jim Crow racial order, 
the pressure to over punish black and Latinx populations is gonna prevent officers from learning that such high levels of punishment are the most effective. And so this is actually, I, think I wanna make this point that this was part of the justification for professionalizing police being a good thing. This is why racial liberals joined with the racial conservatives in the 1950s and 60s to advocate for greater independence for police officers and great, you know, this, this was the, the hope of professionalization that it would, that it would make the organizations resistant to conservative attempts to use them as instruments of racial terror. Um, but the downside is, is when we move into this colorblind racial order, the post-civil rights order, regular pressure to reduce over-punishment of Black and Latinx residents is going to constrain officer learning in that direction. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to talk, this is, um, I'm going to talk through some material which is directly related to this that I think is really cool. I've been looking at recently on human relations training. Uh, I put these slides in here after seeing Professor Pollack's presentation yesterday, because this is like um, spot on. So uh, starting 1943, there were a bunch of race riots in, in several American cities that disrupted the war industries. And so starting at that point, um, professionalizing police police professionals and um, civil rights organizations started focusing much more on thinking about how do we get police to um, to intervene in the case of race riots. So like the D Detroit, uh, well, yeah, in LA there was, and Detroit both, there's good evidence that police basically just let the race riot happen. And for those who are less familiar, a race riot in this context means uh, large numbers of white people attacking black people. Um, and so, or in, in LA it was uh, Chicano youths being attacked mostly. And so uh, civil rights organizations and various other local level uh, institutions were trying to get police departments to train police officers in handling what they called race problems. And so you had some uptake of this, what they called race or human relations training um, in this in the, the first few years. Uh, and it was basically mostly pamphlets that were made available to officers or in-service training programs. Um, by the early 1960s, the sort of national police chiefs organizations were articulating this as an important part of professional preparation for police officers. And some states, including Illinois, legislated that all officers had to receive training in human relations as part of, you know, that was part of their mandatory prep for being police officers. Um, and there was this model of how to introduce this training that was introduced, uh, produced by the American Council on Race Relations. Um, it, and their model consisted of having an academic meet with selected officers from the department and discuss what officers in the department needed to know about dealing with racial problems. So they recommended having these people be senior officers who have a lot of experience and, um, and are well-versed in, in what good policing methods look like. And so after this session, then the academic would write up what these police officers said as most important for their officers to know. And so this you know, so the starting goal for these civil rights organizations was we want to reduce racism among the poli these police officers to make police services more equitable along racial lines. Um, the ending goal, so this is an example of one of these, these training manuals. This was prepared for the Chicago Parks District Police Department uh, by Joseph Lohman, who was uh, later Dean of Berkeley's Criminology Department. Also, a lot of, a lot of Berkeley connections this morning, as you said, Andrew. <laughs> Um, so uh, this is the simply the, um, the table of contents out of this. So these, this first one is basically a lecture on why we should think of human relations, as in like the relations between groups of people, as a as a thing that matters to police departments. And the second is literally is like you know it's, it's, he's a sociologist and he's doing a, like a, a detailed study of. Um, of the conditions within Chicago and then nationally of you know, racial, basically how race correlates with various economic and, and social indicators. Um, the facts about race is the most direct, like, this is him communicating as effectively as he can. Biology does not cause criminology, uh, sorry, does not cause crime, that sort of, that social conditions are criminogenic and there is correlation again between race and social conditions. Um, and then these last two, four and five are about um, uh, basically about handling race riots and like conflicts arising from integration. And so the, and then the, yeah. And then the last section is basically 
what are the laws around discrimination? So what you'll notice there is basically the, the effort has morphed from let's make policing services more equitable to let's convince officers that black people are not biologically criminal, plus let's get them to deal better in circumstances of like mass disorder uh, in the form of a race riot. And so like there are a lot of pieces that fell out between that starting point of let's make policing more equitable and that, that ending point, that, that focusing point. Um, and this is the consequence of that collaborative model. You know, they would meet with these police officers and so then allow these officers to define, to set the agenda on what the objectives for this training should be. And um, so the, during the civil rights era, the, the main goal for these police professionalization uh, advocates was an appearance, the appearance of impartiality in dealing with, with conflicts uh, and the cultivation of community cooperation. Um, and so to be very clear, impartiality in this context means they will enforce whatever laws are on the books. And so it is consistent with enforcing segregation. That was in many cases, the justification they gave for why they have to aggressively enforce segregation laws, because that's what it means to be an impartial enforcer of the law. And so like, actually this, you see this, um, the document was produced for the Chicago Parks District Police Department, Illinois, 1946-47, had anti-discrimination laws on the books. Uh, this exact same training material was used in Kentucky and the Louisville Police Department, where they, except they changed the part at the end, uh, um, the laws affecting uh, integration and segregation. Like then they reproduced Kentucky statutes on, you know, black people will not be, you know, in these, you know, parks will be segregated on the basis of race, of public conveyance, all this. Um, um, yeah, so the, uh, as further evidence of this, uh, this is a quote from William Parker, who was the chief of police in LA in, from 50 to 66, another one of these figures who was central to the police professionalization movement. And he wrote that in 1955, at the present time, race, color, and creed are useful statistical and tactical devices. So are age groupings, sex, and employment. If persons of one occupation for some reason commit more theft than average, then increased police attention is given to persons of that occupation. Discrimination is not a factor there. If persons of Mexico, ne Mexican, Negro, or Anglo-Saxon ancestry for some reason contribute heavily, more heavily to crime, police deployment must take that into account. From an ethnological point of view, Negro, Mexican, and Anglo-Saxon are unscientific breakdowns. They are fiction. From a police point of view, they are a useful fiction and should be used as long as they remain useful. Um, and so, you know, this is approach taken by the American Council on Race Relations as they're trying to form this new professional consensus around how policing should work. You know, they, they tried to sidestep the problem that I am, that I am articulating, uh, this, this problem of, of producing backlash uh, by becoming outside consultants. And the cost of becoming outside consultants was that you had to change your goals to such that they would um, map onto what a person like William Parker thought was a good thing for his department. And I'm almost out of time, um, but I'll end on this slide. Uh, so I think the, you know, there's this overarching question that I think deserves some more attention. Um, is where does racism come from? Where does discrimination come from? So, um, and so I've lined up here several different theories that, uh, that I've encountered and, and thought a lot about on the, on the and divided them according to whether or not the person who is engaging in that discrimination can accurately report that they're doing so. So it's, you know, this is conscious in, uh, accessibility. On, um, and so the first on the left is institutional racism as posited by Ian Haney Lopez. And so this is um, the idea that you're learning how to behave within an organization from other people in that organization. And you learn, basically you're not gonna think too hard about what the consequences racial or otherwise of your practices are going to be. And so you can learn racism or learn practices which will create racial disparity, create discrimination without being consciously aware of it. Um, implicit bias uh, should be uh, familiar to many of you. And so like the idea here is that life exposure or cognitive shortcuts are gonna be causing you to, um, to, to express these biases. And finally, structural racism is one where it, you will be unaware as a defined by Grant Thomas and Powell, you're gonna be unaware of how other kinds of factors within society have influenced the, the, the decision that you have to make. 
Uh, and so you're gonna make a decision off of what you might see as a facially race neutral metric, but then discrimination in other arenas is going to influence the racial distribution of your own decisions. And then on the, on the right side, you have conscious theories of discrimination, first being taste-based, uh, second statistical, as we talked about, um, and then finally stereotyping, where you, know, you, you can at least recognize that you have this, this, um, this thought. And then, so where I'm fitting context-constrained learning as I'm defining it fits as it is conscious discrimination, um, but it doesn't come out of these kinds of individualized factors. It comes out of the design of the bureaucracies and it's mapping onto the political context. Um, and again, uh, harking back to uh, Professor Pollack's presentation from yesterday, you know, I think it's, it's really important to look within, if we're thinking about explaining discrimination within a bureaucracy, think about the political context within that bureaucracy is embedded and how that is going to influence the operation of that bureaucracy over time. So thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Andrew. That was a super interesting talk. Um, we have about eight minutes or so during which we can have some discussion and questions before moving on to the next talk. So feel free to raise your hand or just unmute your yourself and speak up. Well, it, it seems to me that there's an interesting there's an interesting asymmetry with respect to police goals and learning. And what I mean by that is the following. Um, if the question was, how does a police officer learn what arrest strategy or what stop strategy, let me make this concrete, maximizes arrests, that's presumably something from which one can get, draw conclusions from own experience. And that's the logic of the Knowles, Persigo, Todd type models as individual police are uh, differentially sampling and their own choices in equilibrium collectively the equalization of, uh, of, uh, of guilt rates. But if the object, but that of course doesn't make much sense as an objective for a, a police department. Police departments presumably ought to want to minimize the crime rate. That's not something that can be inferred from individual experience. Mm -hmm. In contrast, if one said that the second goal was some notion of fairness, and the one that I would advocate is uh, equal treatment of the innocent, that's something that is inferable. Again, you can construct conclusions about from one's own experience the number if you given who you stop and you look at the ethnicities of the people that were innocent i will have statistics on the fraction of guilty blacks and guilty whites and if they're not equal then uh one of the groups is being uh, being disadvantaged so it's the thing to consider here is uh the relationship between learnable and not learnable police objectives and, uh, and how officers are going to respond. Interesting. Yeah, that's, uh, that's an excellent point that I had not thought about. Um, yeah, and so what am I working off of? This notion of the police objective being to minimize crime, which is not observable to the officers, uh, comes very much out of this sort of the, the efforts at winning greater bureaucratic autonomy that these police chiefs were, were moving. Um, I don't know that there was a specific goal of cutting out lower level officers sort of through this process. I mean, they wanted to make themselves politically indispensable. Um, and so they, they sort of, they pushed to have the reduction of crime become the definition of what police departments were for, which it was not before. Um, so this was like, this is a very intentional political decision on their part. Um, yeah, I had, not considered that potential for different definitions of more observable definitions of police police performance. Um, I'll have to think more about that. Thank you. Um, so I think there's a really nice relationship between your work and the statistical category of the conscious column here, mm -hmm. in the sense that um, traditionally the statistical category has assumed that beliefs are accurate, as in um, Arrow and Phelps, but more recent work in economics has started to think about, well, what if beliefs are inaccurate? So it's still our, it is beliefs that are driving the discrimination, but people may just not have the accurate and um, accurate beliefs about the behavior of the racialized group. And so in that sense, that literature very much takes as a reduced form, just people's beliefs can be wrong. Whereas your model is really providing a micro foundation for one source of why these beliefs could be wrong. In other words, if there's not, if we're not actually generating the information that lets the police officers learn, 
than if they start out with wrong beliefs or they, they may just never actually see anything that contradicts it and lets them update their beliefs to eventually get to these correct beliefs. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that's a, that's a really nice, this constrained learning in this, um, in the political context puts a really nice structure on, in one setting, why we may expect inaccurate beliefs to be able to persist across time. Thanks, yeah. Yeah, and that's, um, or either persist across time, but also potentially be generated, um, you know, in the, in a political context. And so I'm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So be generated and also not eventually be corrected. Um, you know, if you start to think about the dynamic, yeah, dynamics of it, like it, they emerge in this first period, but then as long as these sort of similar political pressures persist or the similar um, behavior of the police chiefs persist, you're actually not going to see information that contradicts it and helps the police officers learn. So any more questions, comments? Yeah, I had a I had a question. Uh, thanks, Andrew. This is really interesting. Um, so one one issue I was struggling with that Steve's comment actually helped a lot with for for clarifying for me is trying to think about uh, the learning process for police officers because uh, in your framework you know they're they're inferring something from police chiefs whereas you know I would think a lot of what they learn about what's effective is from their on the ground experience mm -hmm. and. Um, so this point about, you know, learning about what are the crime minimiz minimization strategies versus, you know, which people are more or less likely to carry contraband. I think that's, that might be an interesting angle to explore. And another thing I was thinking about is, you know, police chiefs have some power over, they have power over how officers are allocated across areas. And so you could think they both affect, they affect both types of learning that officers may have. So both trying to infer from what police use are doing what crime minimization looks like, mm -hmm. but also their learning on the ground about which people are more or less likely to say carry contraband or, or do whatever is influenced by how they're they're allocated across areas. Right. Mm -hmm. So if I have some prior about whether a particular group is likely to carry contraband, yeah. if I'm sent to neighborhoods where I'm never going to interact with that group, then I'm not going to update my beliefs based on that on the ground experience. Whereas if I'm directed to that area, then you could think um, I had some prior, but I'm going to update because I experience uh, I have experience on the ground in that place. And so a police chief has some power over how they learn in that way um, as well, both their on the ground experience also, but also, you know, perhaps uh, they have influence over what officers think about crime minimization just because they they believe whatever the the chief is saying or something like that depending on these political constraints of course but yeah that's that's an excellent point um and not one that i've read about police chiefs taking into account when they're making assignment decisions uh but i think maybe one that andrew little and ryan are are really well positioned to talk about in one minute or so maybe one more uh uh, follow up, and this is uh, perhaps too self serving as it relates to stuff that I've written with Brock, uh, Cooley, and Navarro. It seems to me that if you're going to talk about uh, preferences of police and desire to, to act uh, in a discriminatory fashion, one needs to unpack a little bit what those preferences mean. And what I mean is the following, which is that the police announce uh, the hierarchy announces a policy to reduce differential stops of, of blacks and whites. There's a question of the allocation of the stops among African Americans by the discriminating police. And so you can imagine preference structures. But what happens is you have increases in the stops of African Americans where it's certain, it's extremely unlikely there's contraband uh, being carried. Think of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and whereas you have a reduction uh, amongst uh, whatever subset within the population is more likely. It is really simply because the statistics meet the objective. And uh, that seems to me to be something that's been under under considered here, which is how discriminators respond to mandates, and uh, if there's you know if there's uh, ugly utility being derived from harassing uh, African Americans, it may be higher for people that are perceived to be affluent because of you know the obvious arguments on power, et cetera. So it just may be something to think about is whether you can get uh, perverse reallocations of effort by by discriminators. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.
Um, all right, so it's time to move to the next presentation. So thanks again, Andrew. That was a really nice talk, really interesting work.